think we got it under control now. Hey, thanks everybody for coming. So <clears throat> why don't we start off with a, a basic lecture and we can have more of these in the future if it works out okay for everybody. But uh, welcome everybody from St. Joe's and from Jersey City and uh, from the tumor service. And tonight we're gonna to talk about the radiographic evaluation of musculoskeletal tumors. Can everybody hear me okay? Somebody say, type in okay. Okay, good. So before we start out, you just have to know the basics about uh, bone tumors, right? And our bone tumors are uh, divided into many different categories depending upon what is being produced by the tumors or how the, how the uh, pathologist actually sees them under the microscope and what type of tissue they're producing. So bone tumors uh, develop from primitive mesenchymal cells and these cells can differentiate down various pathways and form different types of tissue. So not only do you, um, uh, so they, they form these different types of tissues and they could either form benign types of tumors or malignant types of tumors. And the tumors are classified according to their different broad categories and then between benign and malignant. And they all have different types of radiographic presentations for the most part, depending upon uh, what type of substances they produce or what type of matrix, right? So spindle cell tumors or mesenchymal cell tumors usually consist of cells and the cells produce a substance which is called the matrix. And they could produce bone, cartilage, fibrous type tissue, and some of them don't produce matrix at all, which would be your small round blue cell type. So in our bone tumor categories, we have osseous producing tumors or tumors that produce uh, bone, cartilage producing tumors, fibrous producing tumors, small round blue cell tumors, giant cell rich tumors, and we have tumors that produce, uh, replicate vascular structures, neurogenic type tumors, cystic tumors, tumors that actually have uh, replicate muscle. Then we have our miscellaneous categories, metastatic lesions, and synovial based tumors which occur in the joints. And you have to sort of memorize this list as a, as a surgeon or starting out and know which ones fall in the benign category and which ones in the malignant category. And they all have different radiographic presentations. So in our benign bone forming category, we have osteoma, osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma. And in our malignant bone producing uh, category, we have osteosarcoma. Right, it's not an osteosarcoma because it occurs in the bone, it's an osteosarcoma because the sarcoma is actually producing bone. In our cartilage category, we have benign uh, tumors such as enchondroma, osteochondroma, chondroblastoma, and chondromyxofibroma. And the malignant variety would be chondrosarcoma. Same thing in fibrous category, we see all our various types of fibrous tumors and the malignant variety are called fibrosarcoma and a very, very poorly differentiated fibrosarcoma, which goes by the name of malignant fibrocystocytoma, nowadays is called an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or a UPS. Our small round blue cell tumors include eosinophilic granuloma, which is benign, and, inf and infection kind of falls in this category because histologically, it can mimic uh, small round blue cell tumors. Ewing sarcoma is our malignant variety and then lymphoma and multiple myeloma fall in that category. Uh, everybody think I think knows giant cell tumor of bone as being a benign tumor. There are very, uh, very, very rare malignant giant cell tumors of bone. And then here are all our other types of tumors just important to memorize this from the outset. Um, in terms of soft tissue tumors, it's very similar. There's the broad categories of tumor and both benign and malignant varieties with some being more common than others. Um, in, in terms of soft tissue tumors, the radiological presentation or the MRI presentation is usually very, very nonspecific. There's very few entities that you can actually diagnose on an MRI. You can probably diagnose a lipoma, 
usually a schwannoma, a hemangioma, and maybe um, fibromatosis, uh, but usually it's very difficult to diagnose um, a soft tissue tumor. And malignancies, soft tissue malignancies usually present at lar as large heterogeneous masses. Liposarcomas, you may be able to identify fat in the mass on an MRI, but often it's very scant and only very astute radiologists can identify that. So uh, your malignant tumors or malignant sar uh, soft tissue sarcomas will mostly show up as heterogeneous masses, and then it's really the biopsy that yields the diagnosis. So when you're looking at a, a, an X-ray of a bone tumor, there's different things that you want to think about, and you want to sort of have a rot routine in going through this. You want to know the bone that's involved and the position of the tumor in the bone, because certain tumors occur in specific bones and or occur more commonly in certain bones uh, compared to others and they may occur in different locations within the bone. You want to look at the pattern of bone destruction, meaning is it geographic, permeative, or moth-eaten. Geographic you can usually uh, identify the tumor very readily, it's usually very well circumscribed. Whereas if it's, if it's permeative or moth-eaten, as down in this area, it may blend imperceptibly with the surrounding bone, and you really can't tell where the tumor begins and ends. You want to look at the margin around the lesion. Is it, do you have a sclerotic margin around it, indicating that it's a very slow-growing tumor? Or is, the, is it a, um, a geographic lesion with virtually no margin around it, indicated indicating that it may be more aggressive or growing more rapidly, like a giant cell tumor of bone. You want to be able to identify if there's any visible, visible tumor matrix. And what we mean by visible tumor matrix is if there's any calcification or ossification. And there is a difference between both radiologically or on x-rays. And that can help you place a tumor in a different category. If you identify ossification, you could usually put it in the osseous producing category. And if you find calcification, you could usually put it in the, the cartilage category. Are there any internal trabeculations? This is an important mnemonic that was made up years ago by some residents that I taught. Dave Chang was named the resident, and they named uh, the types of tumors that, oh, somebody got it right. Who's that? Ah, Dr. Miller. Nice job. Um, so D. Chang, right? So the differential of seeing internal trabeculations include desmoplastic fibroma, uh, chondromyxofibroma, not chondroblastoma, but chondromyxofibroma. H stands for intraosseous hemangioma. A is aneurysmal bone cysts. N is non-ossifying fibroma and G is giant cell tumor of bone. So those are, the, those are the most common types of tumors that have internal trabeculations. Um, Sam got it right, too. <laughs> so you want to also look at what the tumor is doing to the bone. Is it eroding the bone? Has it penetrated the cortex? Is there a surrounding soft tissue mass? Is there cortical expansion? Is the tumor eroding the bone and the endosteum and growing through the cortex, but is there a periosteal reaction being laid down around the soft tissue component, which would indicate a benign type of tumor, as opposed to a malignant type of tumor, which usually grows very rapidly, spreads through the haversion canals. You may not see much cortical destruction, but see a soft tissue mass on the outside of the, uh, of the bone. So just because a tumor has a soft tissue mass around it doesn't mean, or a soft tissue around, mass around the bone does not mean that it's cancerous. Benign types of tumors can develop soft tissue masses. You can, uh, you have to evaluate the periosteal response. So classically, um, there's different types of periosteal reactions that occur around tumors. And benign tumors will usually have a continuous periosteal reaction around it, meaning like you see one thin line that's not broken or, or a thickened area 
that's not broken through. And our interrupted periosteal reactions include our sunburst reaction, uh, hair on end, or uh, sunburst reaction, hair on end, and uh, Codman's triangle. Those are your three types of interrupted reactions, which indicate that it's a malignant type of tumor. Okay, so this is just showing you distinctly what the difference is between a benign and a malignant tumor. And the benign one is actually on your right side, and the malignant one is on your left side. So over here, you have a permeative lesion in the distal femur. You see that this is a skeletally immature patient. And you see that there's a soft tissue mass that's developed outside the bone, but the cortex looks almost intact here and you could barely make out with where this tumor begins and ends. It may extend way up proximally here, um, probably ends at the, the growth plate, which is usually a barrier, but then it extends into the soft tissues. You see at the periphery here, a Codman's triangle, which is an interrupted periosteal reaction. And in the soft tissue component, you could see this fluffy white stuff, which is ossification. Okay, so you put this all together, this looks like a malignant bone producing tumor or an osteosarcoma, right? And that's sort of how you figure out things. Over here with the benign tumor, you can see this is the definition of geographic. Right? You can make out it's a sharp zone of transition between the tumor and the adjacent bone, right? This tumor has been growing relatively slowly as you see a sclerotic margin around it and it's destroyed the cortex. But as it's destroyed the cortex, there's been a periosteal reaction around it to try to contain it, right? So the bone is responding to the tumor. So you always wanna think of what's the, what's the tumor doing to the bone and what is the bone doing back to the tumor, right? So this is an uninterrupted or continuous periosteal reaction. And you put all this together and it's usually indicative of a benign type of tumor. In this case, this malignant tumor is an osteosarcoma. This benign tumor turned out to be an osteoblastoma. Now, they might say, well, I don't see any ossification on the x-ray. You know, how did it turn out to be uh, an, osteo, uh, an osteoblastoma? Well, if you got a CAT scan, you might actually see some ossification within it that you can't pick up on the x-ray. There might be some subtle ossification up over here in the 11 o'clock position. But histologically, you can actually see the bone formation, which is what what's, puts it in that category. But you should at least be able to boil, to boil this all down or to deduce that this is a benign tumor and this is a malignant tumor. Histologically, you can see how, how the the biopsy or how the tumor sample correlates with what you see radiographically. Your malignant tumor, you have cells, it's very hypercellular. You can see here the cells are all uh, packed on top of each other. They're not arranged in any orderly arrangement. So you see uh, large hyperchromatic cells or nuclei. The nuclei are very large. There's really very little cytoplasm around it, so there's a high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. There's crowding. There's probably mitotic figures if you look closely, and they're, they're not. They're haphazardly arranged. It's producing this pink substance, which is immature bone formation or osteoid. Right? And you can see this lace-like osteoid throughout it. You don't really see any trabeculae being formed here. Right, so as things are more benign or less aggressive, they try to recapitulate normal anatomy uh, more closely. And as they become more uh, de-differentiated or, or pleomorphic or undifferentiated, they're less likely to resemble normal anatomy. So you look on the right here, and this is what an osteoblastoma looks like. You see the osteoblasts lined up nicely along the the trabeculae of bone, and you see that the bone is being laid down or the immature bone is being laid down in a way where it's all sort of interconnecting. It's trying to form normal bone here or normal trabeculae. So you put this all together with the radiological studies 
and you should be able to come up with your diagnosis. And this is really what, what the majority of your OITE tries to test you on, is radiological pathological correlation. And sometimes they go a step further. So just uh, schematically, your benign lesions right, have a well-defined or sclerotic border. They're geographic. They may lack a soft tissue mass or have a soft tissue mass, but if they do, there's a solid periosteal reaction usually around it. And sometimes you can only identify that solid periosteal reaction on a CAT scan. Your malignant lesions, you have an interrupted periosteal reaction. It's permeative or morphy, and you can't make out where it begins or ends. You usually have a large soft tissue mass, and when we say that you can't make it out where it begins or ends, begins or ends, that's called a wide zone of transition. Okay, so these are just some examples. This is an example of a geographic pattern of bone destruction. Right? Very well circumscribed, large. It's expanding the distal radius. This is an example of an ABC in the proximal tibia. We only have one view here, but probably the way it's shaped, it gives you some idea that in other areas of the bone, maybe not full thickness, there's some involvement, but you can see here there's a very sharp line around it or a sharp zone of transition. And what does it have in the middle here, Justin Miller? Boom, trabeculations, nice. So, uh, and this is just, if you had a hard time telling on the x-ray if this was geographic or mothy, and you get a CAT scan, and a CAT scan can help you, or you get a MRI. CAT scans are useful for identifying mineralization. You might not be able to pick up so readily uh, on an x-ray. So you see here that there's, um, you know, it's geographic, and you can tell that by the this zone of transition or this line between the tumor and the adjacent bone. This is an example of a chondroblastoma. You see this in the tibial eminence, right? But if you can't see it too well, you get a CAT scan. This is another uh, benign tumor. I think that this was also a chondroblastoma in the proximal humerus. Very well circumscribed in that geographic pattern of bone destruction. An MRI can be useful for it also. Sometimes kids are put in splints when you have to evaluate them. You don't want to look down here because it's expanding the bone, but you want to look up here and you see a sharp zone of transition between the tumor and normal bone, right? You're always looking where the tumor meets normal bone to tell if it's geographic permeative or mothy. And but you can see that what's happened here is the bone has been eroding the endosteal surface of the cortex and gradually going outward. And the bone is responding to that by laying down new periosteum. And that's what, new uh, periosteal bone. And that's what we call the expanded appearance of the bone, which usually indicates that it's benign. In terms of ABCs, another thing that you would look at on an MRI are fluid fluid levels. And you can see, remember, this patient is lying on their back. They're in the MRI. But the blood in an ABC settles to the bottom of the lesion, so you see this layering effect, which is virtually diagnostic of an ABC, provided that you're seeing a geographic lesion. You just always have to remember that um, telangiectatic osteosarcomas can sometimes have a similar appearance. So when we're referring to, to benign types of tumors, you often have to determine on the x-rays how you're going to treat them. Right? And sometimes the sclerotic margin around them will help you tell how aggressively, how aggressive they are. If they're just sitting there and they're indolent and perhaps the person was born with it, like a non-ossifying fibroma, or if they're very aggressive. So we call these types of margins around them, they've been separated into different categories, 1A, 1B, and 1C. Right. In the 1A category, you have a thick, complete sclerotic margin, which usually indicates an indolent lesion, like this diagram here, or like a non-ossifying fibroma, likely sitting there not doing much. 2B, you start to lose it, or it becomes thin, 
may indicate a more active lesion that's growing but not really rapidly growing. And a, uh, type C is an aggressive lesion where it's benign, you can make out the borders of it, but there's no sclerotic margin around it, meaning that it's growing fairly rapidly. It may be one of those types of tumors that penetrate the cortex and grow into the soft tissues like an aggressive giant cell tumor. So giant cell tumors can actually fit in the 1B or the 1C category. Chondroblastomas are usually more 1B than 1C. non us five fibromas are 1A. We know that as you go from 1A to 1C, the recurrence rate after a keratage increases. So 1A, a non-ossifying fibroma, usually never recurs after you cure it and bone graft it, whereas a 1C, uh, a giant cell tumor that's very aggressive, usually about 60% of the time it will recur if you don't use liquid nitrogen. So these are your different margins around it. What, that's an, this is a typical non-ossifying fibroma, right? You see the internal trabeculations. And you want to always, anytime you see this, always go over in your mind again, what's the differential of internal trabeculations? D. Chang, right? Desmoplastic fibroma, chondromyxofibroma, hemangioma, aneurysmal bone cyst, non-ossifying fibroma, and giant cell tumor. Another example where a patient actually fractured through their NOF. Okay, might look aggressive to you on the outside here because it almost looks like it's expanding into the leg, but you see the internal trabeculations and you see this thick sclerotic margin around it, indicating that it's, that it's indolent. Here's an example of a 1B, a giant cell tumor bone, right? The margin around it is thinner. Here's a 1C, right? Many people would look at this and say, oh, geez, this has got to be a malignancy. Look at the bones completely destroyed. There's this huge soft tissue mass. But what's, what's a few characteristics here that, you, that should lead you in the direction of thinking that this is benign, right? You have a sharp zone of transition here between the tumor and the adjacent bone. You have internal trabeculations and you have a periosteal reaction around the perimeter of the soft tissue mass. You see this eggshell periosteum. Right, this is a giant cell tumor of bone occurring in the distal radius. The distal radius is the third most common site for a giant cell tumor of bone. It goes distal femur, proximal tibia, then distal radius, and then the sacrum. Okay, again, this is a 1C also of a giant cell tumor of bone. Right, you don't really see a thick, uh, much of a margin around it. And expand into the soft tissues like it did in this location. Okay, and here's more of a permeative mothian type of destruction, usually indicative of malignancy or infection. The other thing that you have to remember is that eosinophilic granuloma can look like anything. It could look like a benign or a malignant tumor. Also, there tends to be uh, sort of a continuum or a, a blending of mothy and bone destruction and permeative bone destruction. Rarely do you see something that's purely permeative or purely mothy, and usually you also see permeation through the bone if you see this mothy in appearance where you have holes in the bone separated from each other. But if you do see, sometimes uh, if the contrast is poor, you might just see a few holes separated from each other. You have to always remember to closely examine that patient and to take it a step further, maybe with an MRI or a CAT scan. And again, this is another example of permeative. You can't make, sh make out where this lesion begins or ends, but this is a very worrisome x-ray if you saw it. Here you have two Codman's triangles, one on each side of the lesion. So the lesion has formed here in the center of the bone, spread out through the haversion systems, right? Remember the benign tumors are growing more slowly. They actually destroy the cortex to get into the soft tissues. But these rapidly dividing tumors can spread into the soft tissues without much cortical destruction. It sort of looks ratty, we call it, right? Kind of a little thin or, or have some lucencies through it, 
but then the soft tissue mask is coming out here and destroying the periosteum. Another example of permeative of the superior pubic ramus. This was a lymphoma case, and you see, um, you see uh, the tumor permeating throughout the superior pubic ramus, probably involving the acetabular area. Another example of a permeative lesion. Okay, this actually, you can see this um, white area that looks like ossification, and it turned out that this was reactive sclerosis and another example of lymphoma. Very rarely are there many tumors that can give you this reactive sclerosis. You usually will see it in, in lymphoma or in an infection. E, um, Ewing sarcoma does not give you reactive sclerosis. So if you see reactive sclerosis, you don't want to think Ewing sarcoma. Or if you see something that looks ossification, think osteosarcoma, or also possible is, is lymphoma. When lymphoma goes into the soft tissues, though, if it forms a soft tissue mass, you will not see any bone production or ossification in the soft tissues, whereas with an osteosarcoma, you will. Again, permeative bone destruction here with an osteosarcoma. So sometimes these can go missed on an x-ray. Lymphoma with a fracture, again, just multiple examples of permeation. This was a Ewing sarcoma that presented with a pathologic fracture. And you see the permeation through the marrow and actually a soft tissue mass more proximally. This was an interesting case. The, the, girl went undiagnosed for many, many months. Uh, she had repeated x-rays. It was when I was at NYU in Bellevue. And this turned out to be a lymphoma of the proximal tibia. Nobody ever examined her and detected the mass arising from her knee area. She kept on coming in complaining of knee pain. And the contrast was not great on the scan, on the x-rays. And nobody picked up that there was a permeative lesion in the tibia okay, on the AP or the lateral. Ultimately, an MRI and a CAT scan was gotten, and you could see here how the whole proximal tibia is replaced with tumor. And all that would have required is a physical examination to detect the mass. And this, anybody have an idea what type of tumor this is? So I'll tell you, this is an unusual spot for it. Put together the what you think what we've just discussed and narrow it down it's not following all the rules this one but think about it is it permeative multi inner geographic what bone is it caught stemming from uh, and does it have any vis visible matrix does it have a periosteal reaction that's a that's uh, aggressive or interrupted or continuous? Anybody want to type in some answers? Age would be between, uh, let's say, about 17. permeative to me. Todd Pierce, you have any idea? Michael, what's your last name?
Pete, you taking another guess? So it looks like the majority said osteosarcoma. <laughs> so many good options. <laughs> okay, so be, so first of all, this is a permeative lesion, right? So think malignant, right? And between the ages of 10 and 20, there's two main things that you're going to think of between the age of 10 and 20, osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. Right, those are the two main ones. Lymphoma does come up also. That's that's probably the third one. Infection, e.g., right. But um, so you might answer. You might answer Ewing sarcoma here because it's diaphyseal. But 10% of osteosarcomas actually arise from the diaphysis, and you can see here that you have a very large soft tissue mass. You have a Codman's triangle here at the perimeter, right? And in this soft tissue mass, you see fluffy white mineralization through it, indicating that there's ossification going on. So a malignant appearing tumor with ossification is an osteosarcoma until proven otherwise, right? So it's one of the, one of the cases where it's an unusual presentation for an osteosarcoma because usually it would occur metaphyseal, distal femur, proximal tibia, the humerus is the third most common site, but only 10% occur in the diaphysis and would still be treated the same way as a conventional osteosarcoma. Right. Ewing's has no matrix, correct. Ewing's is small round blue cell tumor and they do not have any matrix at all. Like they're just all cells, they don't produce anything. So if you give chemotherapy to an osteosarcoma and you have a great response, you kill all the cells in the osteosarcoma, but you're left with the matrix. So you might not see a reduction in the size of the tumor very much because that matrix still exists after the tumors are, tumor cells are killed but you kill, an os, you kill Ewing sarcoma with chemotherapy and you might see dramatic shrinkage because, uh, it, uh, because there's no matrix and all the cells just disappear when they're dead. So just, just uh, keep that in the back of your mind, easier way to remember it. All right, so when we talk about visible tumor matrix, we're usually talking about tumor, that, I mean, uh, matrix that mineralizes, meaning, gets calcium deposition within it. And radiologically, we refer to this calcium deposition as either being calcif calcifications or ossifications, meaning ossification usually indicates some type of bone production. Calcifications are usually stippled or look, have look like rings and arcs and um, uh, usually have, uh, I'd say, look look more intense on a radiograph, and ossification usually looks more solid or cloud-like or, or ivory-like. Calcification usually indicates a cartilage tumor, and the reason why you see ring and, rings and arcs in a cartilage tumor is because histologically um, cartilage grows in balls. Does anybody remember Dr. Uh, Schiller talking about the blue balls of cartilage. So it grows in balls, and around the perimeter of the balls, you get you get uh, you get uh, ossification going on around the perimeter. And if it if you get ossification around the entire perimeter with calcium deposition, then that forms a ring around the around a ball, and if it only goes halfway around the ball, it forms an arc. So you have to look very closely at the x-rays to pick it out. So you could also get some mineralization from fracture callus, um, dead, dead tissue, necrotic tissue. Okay, but when you get calcification, you want to think of, 
your your benign types of cartilage. And this is a, an example of ring and arc calcifications. If you look very closely at this X-ray, you can see here it looks like a donut, right? Where there's stipple, stipple. I always think that it looks like pieces of popcorn in here. Sometimes you get an, a CAT scan and you can discern the rings and arcs a little bit better on a CAT scan. But this is the, the secondary ossification going around the perimeter of the lobules. So remember, this is like residual cartilage that's left in the bone. For the, your entire life, it's always trying to make bone so you get this uh, secondary ossification around the perimeter. Again, here's an enchondroma. This is a chondrosarcoma, right? So this is a cartilage tumor that developed in a digit, exceedingly rare, but you could see the calcification within the lesion. And if you look very closely, you see little rings, which should be the, the key and little arcs, little stipple there is, that should be the key that, to telling you that this is cartilaginous in nature. Here's an osteochondroma arising from the distal femur. Right, you see little rings and arcs and calcification in the cap of it. This is one with a fairly large cap, but the patient is still skeletally immature. You can have a very thick cap while a patient's skeletally immature. Here's one that's a more aggressive lesion. You see a lytic area next to a calcified area, and you could see the rings and arcs in the calcified area, but the lytic area. This is an example of a de-differentiated Okay, so on the other hand, this is what ossification looks like. This is an extreme example next to, uh, next to a joint. So you might look at this and say that this is um, soft tissue osteosarcoma or maybe an osteosarcoma arising from the bone. You can't really tell based on the x-rays. You might have to get a CAT scan or an MRI, but we know that uh, patients with kidney problems or on chronic dialysis can form these large calcified masses, and there's other uh, certain conditions where uh, you can form these large masses around the joints. Osteosarcoma has ossification, and you can see here fluffy and cloud-like within the bone and also in the soft tissue mass around the outside of the bone. Sometimes a CAT scan can help you if you can't really determine it on an X-ray. The lateral of, of that patient may help you more where you see it's all fluffy and cloud-like densities. And actually, here's an area next to the bone that looks more ivory-like. This was our case that we looked at, right? Fluffy and cloud-like. Again, just important to kind of know the distinction before you get your, go to your biopsy. This is a periosteal osteosarcoma. Again, you can see very ivory-like. You don't see ring and arc calcifications or stippled or little balls. Ventral intramedullary osteosarcoma, which you can make out very nicely, this white ivory area in the center of the bone. Parosteal osteosarcoma. Right, you see this ivory-like mineralization associated with the tumor on the back surface of the bone. Again, our, our internal trabeculations, and I say this over and over and over again because this is actually very helpful on your OITE. You should really know this differential is D. Chang, right? Because some people might look at this and say, oh, geez, this is malignant. But these are really reactive internal trabeculations that are thickened and responding to the tumor, right? So this is a giant cell tumor, but your D. Chang, desmoplastic fibroma, chondromyxofibroma, um, H is hemangioma, aneurysmal bone cysts, non ossifying fibroma, and giant cell tumor. Example of a desmoplastic fibroma. Usually, the internal trabeculations on a desmoplastic fibroma are extremely thickened. Chondromyxofibroma usually has more scant type of internal trabeculations. Chondromyxofibroma, remember, the most common area is the tibia, 
and it arises very eccentric from the bone, very similar to a non-ossifying fibroma, except it's more aggressive and usually never has a very thick sclerotic margin around it. And one side always looks more aggressive than the other. See the difference between that and the non-ossifying fibroma, where you usually have a much thicker sclerotic margin along the medullary side of the lesion. Neurismal bone cysts. See here some minor internal trabeculations throughout it. So in terms of periosteal reactions, it's important to differentiate between what's a benign appearing periosteal reaction and a malignant appearing periosteal reaction. Cancers grow very rapidly, so they spread through the haversion systems, and they grow so rapidly that the periosteum or the adjacent bone really doesn't have much of a chance to respond to it, or the osteoclasts don't have that time to respond to it and, and the osteoblast to create uh, reactive bone formation. So when you have a malignant tumor that spreads into the soft tissues, it actually destroys the periosteum in the area where it penetrates the bone, but it can lift it up at the perimeter, or if it spreads very rapidly through the, through the haversion systems, spreads into the soft tissues, think of it, it's sort of streaming out in like a spray, if you took a garden hose or something and sprayed it, streams out and the bone in between the haversion systems can react to it if the periosteum isn't destroyed. And that's where you get your sunburst or your um, hair on end periosteal reactions. Whereas benign tumors, they grow slowly, the periosteum can react against it as it grows outside the bone, so you will get a continuous periosteal reaction around that soft tissue component. When you have a continuous periosteal reaction, it's usually referred to as buttressing, and you can see that over here, or the cortex or cortical thickening. The cortex, in many instances, can look just thickened in that area uh, throughout the area of the lesion. Same thing on this side. You see where the periosteum has been laid down around the perimeter of this lesion. Okay. And just various examples here. Here's benign appearing lesion along the surface of the bone, indicating something is going on in the bone. This is an osteoid osteoma, right, occurring on the surface of the cortex or maybe intracortical, and a benign appearing periosteal reaction around it. Right. It's continuous, it's not interrupted in any location, and that's what we refer to as continuous. Your main types of malignant appearing periosteal reactions go by various names. Onion skin, where you have multiple concentric layers, which is often due to um, variation in the tumor growth at various times during the day or during the week or month. Todman's triangle, sunburst reaction, hair on reaction. Your sunburst is where the rays extend away from the bone at an angle and hair on end is where the rays are perpendicular to the bone. So this is an onion skin appearance, and this is not considered a continuous periosteal reaction, right? Because there's a separation between all these various layers, and it indicates that there's some variation in, in the rapidity of growth, maybe during the day, maybe influenced by hormones. Nobody really knows, but that can occur. You see a hair on end, I mean not a hair on end, a, a um, onion skinning here, right? And interestingly, if you look at this tumor on the right in the mid shaft of the femur in a skeletally immature patient, you see this onion skinning going on, but the tumor looks pretty geographic. This turned out to be an eosinophilic granuloma. So this is one of the exceptions to the rule. Eosinophilic granuloma really can have a variable appearance, can look benign or malignant, and can produce various types of periosteal reactions. Podman's triangle. Tumor 
has spread through the bone, formed the mass here, but lift, destroyed the periosteum in this location, but lifted up the periosteum at its perimeter. Very bad sign if you see that on an X-ray. Same thing here, other Todman's triangles. You can see very, very subtle, so sometimes you have to look very closely at it. Some burst reaction where it comes out sort of at an angle to the bone. Okay, this is all the bone in between the haversion systems or the periosteum producing this uh, sort of uh, aggressive reaction. More of a hair on end where it comes out perpendicular to the bone and bad appearing stuff. This is a, right, does anybody want to take a guess at what this is? Distal femur, skeletally immature. What's going on here? What's the, what's the diagnosis? or most likely diagnosis, statistically. Not parosteal. So you see here a permeative reaction throughout the bone, and there's bone production inside the bone in the medullary canal, and then there's this hair on end, or this uh, yeah, more of a hair on end. It might be a variation also of sunburst, but it, it's very very bad looking. So more of a fast growing type of tumor. Par parosteals usually, so I understand you see this area here on the surface of the bone. Usually parosteals remain confined to the surface of the bone and don't permeate through. Remember, they're low grade. Parosteals are low grade and slow growing. Um, so usually if they pen back penetrate into the bone, it's not a, uh, they usually erode through it. It's not a permeative appearance to it. So this would your most likely diagnosis would be conventional osteosarcoma, right, which you're going to treat with preoperative chemotherapy, surgical resection, limb sparing in 95% of cases, and postoperative chemotherapy. And the most common chemotherapy agents that are used for it are doxorubicin, cisplatin, and high-dose methotrexate. Right, so you usually give two cycles before surgery, sometimes three, depending upon various factors. But usually two, you do the surgery, and then you give four afterward for a total of six cycles. And then you assess the response in the, in the specimen, and if there's greater than 90% of the tumor dead, that usually correlates with a good response. And those kids usually have pretty much uh, an 85% chance of being cured as opposed to those who don't have greater than 90%, which then those kids have about a 65% chance of being cured. So and that's presuming that it's not metastatic to begin with. If it's metastatic to begin with, then it's more, more or less like a 15% chance of being cured. So what's the most common state of METs for a uh, conventional osteosarcoma? Lung, correct. Lung is the most common site. Okay, and you can actually still be cured if you can have your lung mets resected. There's about a 15% cure rate if a person presents with mets. Is Jackie on? I think Gingling's asking you, Jack. What is the second most common site? For 
formats. Think about the difference in the staging studies that we get for an osteosarcoma versus a soft tissue sarcoma. Right, so the second most common site for METS is the bone and the liver is the third most common site. Very rarely uh, do you ever get bony METs without having uh, pulmonary METs first. Okay. But the cure rate for an osteosarcoma with a person who has bony METs is virtually zero. It's very difficult to cure a person. So a person who presents with a soft tissue mass, you know, soft tissue masses can occur with primary malignant bone tumors, benign aggressive tumors, metastases, or osteomyelitis can even present with a soft tissue mass. And this is just showing you schematically, again, what we've talked about, that just because a patient has a soft tissue mass, don't automatically think that the tumor is malignant, right? If it has a, if it's benign, it's going to have a periosteal reaction around it, and more than likely the entire cortex is going to be destroyed. You may not be able to see this periosteal reaction on an X-ray, so you might have to get a CAT scan to see it. Malignant, malignant tumors will destroy the periosteum over it, so you will never see in a malignant tumor a periosteal reaction around the soft tissue component, but you may see it at the perimeter or you may have this, uh, this hair on end appearance or, or sort of um, appearance bet um, between, uh, between the haversion systems. So this was a tumor that everybody thought was cancerous in a child, right? She was maybe 10 years old. But looking at this from an X-ray, you see a very large mass here, and you can almost make, this, make out this white line around the mass. You can see here, it looks like a sharp cutoff between the mass and the bone and over here, although you can have there's a hard time telling it. The MRI certainly doesn't help you in this instance unless you page through it a little, little bit. Right, you see this big tumor with cystic cavities and possible hemorrhage and necrosis, and it looks aggressive. But then you look at the CAT scan, you see here this sharp cutoff between the tumor and normal bone, and then you kind of see this periosteal reaction forming a solid line around the soft tissue component. So this, this was indicative of it being a benign type of tumor, and when it was biopsied, it turned out to be an aneurysmal bone cyst. Same thing here. This is a, an aggressive giant cell tumor of bone. You see over here where you lose the cortex, and you really, on the x-ray, you really don't see the periosteal reaction around it. But you look over here and you see that it more or less looks like a sharp zone of transition, but it loses its sclerotic margin. So this is that type C sclerotic margin around it, which indicates a more aggressive type of tumor. But you get a CAT scan and you can see around that soft tissue component, there's this eggshell rim of calcification around it, indicating that the periosteum is intact and it's likely to be benign. Okay. Subtle finding here, here's an, an example of an osteosarcoma, a very small one next to the periphery of the bone, so you don't see much intraosseously, but you pick up this tiny little Codman's triangle at the perimeter, and you have to be very astute and suspicious when you see that. This is what the CAT scan looked like on that patient. And you see a permeative lesion in the bone. There's no sharp cutoff any place. And you see this bone production in the bone and periosteal reaction. This is what the MRI looked like. Okay. 
So when you're thinking, you know, these are all types of things, we're, we're going to go through this, but we're going to actually put this online and re record this session. But these are all types of things that you really just need to sort of sit down and memorize. You need to know what types of what ages uh, the tumors, various types of tumors occur in radiologically, where the tumors occur within the bone in both the longitudinal plane and the transverse plane. So do they occur epiphyseal, metaphyseal, or diaphyseal? Do they occur central within the bone, eccentric, cortically based, or occur in the actual soft tissues? So looking at, at this schematic, giant cell tumor usually occurs along the perimeter of the bone. I mean, the, the uh, eccentrically within the bone. It's very characteristic. It usually rises in the metaphysis and extends into the epiphysis. Simple bone cysts usually arise centrally within the bone. Fibrous cortical defects and non-ossifying fibromas actually arise within the cortex. Aneurysmal bone cysts arise eccentrically and usually expand the cortex. Chondromyxofibromas usually arise from the cortex and expand the cortex. Osteomas occur on the surface of the bone, right? Enchondromas usually occur centrally, and fibrous tumors usually occur centrally, fibrous dysplasia. So tumors that occur along the central axis, enchondromas, fibrous dysplasia, and bone cysts, your eccentric lesions, giant cell tumor, osteosarc, chondrosarc, chondromyxofibroma, cortical lesions, non-ossifying fibromas. Remember, osteoid osteomas can also Juxtacortical lesions, which are called surface lesions of bone, or like your juxtacortical chondroma, periosteal osteosarcoma, or chondrosarcoma, paraosteal osteosarcoma. Remember, there's no such thing as a paraosteal chondrosarcoma. You have periosteal chondrosarcomas, but no paraosteal. Osteosarcomas, you have both paraosteal and periosteal. And sometimes they're just lumped together and said called juxtacortical or surface osteosarcomas. Um, you need to memorize your list of tumors that occur in the epiphysis, really. So your epiphyseal types of tumors, the two ones, the two of them that should come to your immediate attention um, should be chond uh, chondroblastoma, right, usually in the up to 20 year of age category and clear cell chondrosarcoma. Metz myeloma lymphoma can, of course, involve their osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma can involve the epiphysis. Lipoma, uh, intraosseous lipoma can involve the epiphysis. Eosinophilic granuloma can arise in the epiphysis. And intraosseous ganglion uh, or gang, uh, you know, an intraosseous ganglion is, is essential, essentially a subchondral cyst, except that there's no, no arthritis present in the joint. So those are, that's your main different, and infection. You always have to think infection. So chondroblastoma, clear cell chondrosarcoma, osteoid osteoma, osteoblastoma, eosinophilic granuloma, intraosseous glang, ganglion, infection, intraosseous lipoma, Metz myeloma lymphoma, that's your differential there. So always think age. Enchondromas, very, ra very rarely, there's very rare reported cases of enchondromas occurring in the epiphysis. Your metaphyseal lesions um, include giant cell tumor, right? So your giant cell tumor really arises in the metaphysis and almost always extends into the epiphysis. So some people include that in the epiphyseal category of tumors. Non-ossifying fibromas occur in the metaphysis, chondromyxofibroma, simple bone cysts, osteochondromas, Brody's abscess, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, MFH, and fibrosarcoma of bone. Is that your 
mnemonic, Justin, for epiphyseal tumors? Clem Ku E. <laughs> Sounds pretty easy. Oh, kids coo. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> I think that's a good one. Okay. So these are all things that you just have to memorize. Diaphyseal lesions, usually Ewing sarcoma, right, arises in the diaphysis or involves the diaphysis. So usually Ewing's is diaphyseal or metadiaphyseal. Uh, Non-ossifying fibroma, usually when it arises in the metaphysis, usually it arises at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. Uh, simple bone cysts can also arise in the diaphysis. ABCs can extend down that way. Uh, osteoblastomas, enchondromas, fibrous dysplasia, adamantinoma, and osteofibrous dysplasia. Where do adamantinoma and osteofibrous dysplasia almost uh, solely arise from? What bone? Nice, tibia, right? And most people think that adamantinoma somehow arises from osteofibrous dysplasia because they have the same genetic translocation, right? Somehow predisposes to it, but nobody, I don't think anybody really knows for sure. Okay, what are your, what are your bones in your body that are uh, considered epiphyseal equivalent areas. So your subcon so this this means that these areas typically have the, um, when a tumor arises in it, it's typically one of the tumors that would arise in an epiphysis. So the subchondral region of your acetabulum and your scapula, right? Your talus, uh, John, right? And your calcaneus, exactly, Sam. Good, excellent. In terms of your growth plate, tumors usually do not cross the growth plate. So if you have a tumor arising in the metaphysis that spreads into the epiphysis through a growth plate, you have to really contemplate if that's an infection. So you have, when you're a child, you have hematopoietic marrow throughout your entire axial and appendic appendicular skeleton, right? And when you reach skeletal maturity, you no longer usually have hematopoietic marrow in your long bones. It's, it's located toward the top of your long bones in your metaphysis or your epiphysis, or really in your pelvis and in your spine. And there's a predilection for certain tumors to involve uh, the, the hematopoietic marrow in adults, uh, and this includes metastatic disease, myeloma, Ewing sarcoma, and types of lymphomas. Um, that's just for general knowledge. So that's why myeloma, typically the most common presentation is really in your spine and in your pelvis, right? Uh, you can have tumors that develop in specific areas where there's rapid growth. So we, we, we think that osteosarcomas and giant cell tumors and, um, and uh, your uh, Ewing sarcomas that they develop in the distal femur and proximal tibia most commonly because those are areas with the most rapid bone turnover, proximal humerus being the third most and this is another diagram you should memorize in terms of tumors that are affect vertebral bodies. So certain tumors have a propensity to 
affect or arise from the posterior aspect of the vertebrae or the posterior elements, and certain ones involve the anterior aspect. Most of the tumors that involve the posterior aspect are benign. So osteoblastoma and osteoid osteoma and ABC are the most common tumors that are most common aggressive tumors back in, in the uh, that involve the posterior elements. Osteochondroma can arise there, and chondromyxofibroma. Chondromyxofibroma, that's an exceedingly rare location for that. Tumors that involve the, the anterior body, you have to think malignancy, okay? More likely for a malignant tumor to arise from this location, such as lymphoma, Hodgkin's, myeloma, Ewing, osteosarc, chondrosarcoma, and metastases. So a metastasis is more likely to involve the body than it is the posterior elements, although one of the classic questions on, on your boards shows you an example of a pedicle that's destroyed in somebody above the age of 50, and it's a metastasis. Okay. Uh, hemangiomas, intrusive hemangiomas can involve the, the vertebral bodies, e.g., and fibrous dysplasia can also involve the vertebral bodies. And just lists to memorize, your sacrum, these are the most common tumors that arise from the sacrum, chordoma, right? Chordoma you really never see arising outside of the spine. The sacrum and the, the clevis or the upper cervical spine are the most common sites. Myeloma and plasma cytoma, giant cell tumors arise in the sacrum. The sacrum is the fourth most common site. METs, simple cysts, and actually neurogenic tumors and schwannomas. You can have very large neurogenic cysts that arise in the sacrum. They can look very aggressive. Ribs are often sites of METs, fibrous dysplasia, and enchondromas. Metacarpals and phalanges uh, are often sites of enchondroma. Giant cell tumors can occur in your metacarpals and phalanges. Giant cell reparative granuloma. Giant cell reparative granuloma is actually thought to be what's called a solid aneurysmal bone cyst, so it could go by two different names. Sarcoidosis can affect the bones and show up as lesions in the, in the, in the, the hand. ABCs can occur in the hand and fibrous dysplasia. Terminal phalanges uh, can uh, have inclusion cysts, glomus tumors, or METs, most commonly the lung. So it's very common for, for tumors to metastasize below the elbows, but if you see something that looks like a MET in the distal phalanx, you have to think of the lung, because it's a very uh, common site or common primary when uh, that occurs. So these are just lists that you really have to go through and memorize and put together with what um, we talked about. So, so this is a lesion in a skeletally immature patient. Anybody have an idea of what it is? It's fairly well circumscribed. Look over here. This is the bone, and this is actually the tissue biopsy. So when you're thinking central access, right, you're usually thinking either enchondroma, UBC, or fibrous type tumors. It's well circumscribed. So you look over here, this is the normal bone, and this is just like one of those cruddy slides that they show you on the OITE with a small sample of the tumor next to it. To me, this looks like fibrous type tissue. So I would say that this is a ground glass appearance. 
and that this is uh, – oh, I'm sorry. No, nope, I'm making a mistake. I'm leading you down the wrong line. They're showing you here the bone and very scant tissue here, right, kind of lining the cavity. So I would agree with, let's see, Todd and Justin and Tom who say UBC, right? So think central UBC. This is the, the lining of a UBC, which tends to be very bland. Here's another example of a lesion that's centrally located. And when you look here, you want to look at the junction of the tumor with normal bone here. Where is it occurring in the bone? It's occurring in the metaphysis. This is what the histology looks like. Dr. Patel on? It's awfully quiet. So you see a central lesion, right? And this is more of the ground glass appearance that you would see. And then you see fibrous tissue here with these islands of bone within it, right? And there's no osteoblasts around these islands of bone. That's all consistent with fibrous dysplasia. They sometimes call these Chinese characters or alphabet soup. <laughs> Yeah, I know Jay's being nice. He doesn't want to give all the answers away. Fibrous dysplasia. This is one that wants the, you need to practice your um, knowledge of mineralization, right? So you see here a tumor that's heavily mineralized. Is this ossification or calcification? I don't know with the pathology next to it, you might not really even need to know, but so I see ring and arcs. Right, exactly. This looks like an enchondroma. Right, so Histologically, with an enchondroma, you see cells that are in lacunae, right? And you see this ground glass matrix between it that usually stains a little bit light blue because of the glycosamine and glycans, right? Enchondromas are very hypocellular, right? This is what normal cartilage looks like. The cells are spaced apart. They're small nuclei. The nuclei look fairly uniform. No mitotic figures. Okay, if this was a chondrosarcoma, there would be one cell on top of the other throughout this entire slide. Oh, got that one right, right? We did that one, giant cell tumors. So look in the histology, all the giant cells separated. We looked at this one. This one looks like a patient who is no longer skeletally mature, but maybe the growth plates just closed recently. So again, when you're looking at this, you see something arising eccentrically in the metaphysis. You think about what your eccentric metaphyseal tumors are. You have a Codman's triangle here, right? Is there any visible matrix in the bone, or is there a soft tissue mass with visible matrix? Something may be going on here, a little bit of a hard call, but you can see here you do have a mass that's sticking outside the bone over here, and there's a lot more of the bone involved than you would think on the x-ray.
when you look at the histology, what's going on with the histology. Very hypercellular. And what is all this stuff through it, all this pink lease like material through it. So put together this with the x-rays and what do you have? So you have a malignant appearing tumor that's forming osteoid, right? So it's called an osteosarcoma, right? And you're not going to call this a paraosteal osteosarcoma. This is a conventional osteosarcoma. Paraosteal osteosarcomas actually look low grade. This does not look low grade, right? Look low grade, and they actually look like fibrous tissue. They look almost similar to fibrous dysplasia, actually. So you have to put your, together your radiographs with what you see histologically. And periosteal uh, osteosarcomas are actually chondroblastic tumors. They have a lot of cartilage in them. So you would treat this with pre-op chemo, surgical resection, and some post-op chemo. So here's a more difficult one. So this is a 15-year-old boy with a lesion of the proximal tibia, and you want to decide if this is benign or cancerous. And you're going to look at your x-rays and your MRI. It's rising eccentrically, right? Look at all your features. Think of location in the bone, age of the patient, visible matrix, geographic permeative or moth eaten, and periosteal reactions. Nice, nice, nice work. So right, so we have a lesion of the upper tibia, right? And you're initially drawn to this blown out area here, right? But you see how the, the tumor kind of permeates through here, and it's really not well circumscribed. Here, here it's, you know, you see like there's sclerosis around it, but it's not a clear line of sclerosis. So it's, it's somewhat permeative, but over here, the key to this being really aggressive is the Codman's triangle or the periosteal reaction. You don't see much mineralization going on within it, but your MRI over here shows you a tumor with fluid fluid levels, and you have the layering of the blood products along the gravity dependent area, because remember, this patient's laying down in an MRI. But I think with this, you can't tell. Over here, this looks to me more malignant than benign. MRI, you can't tell, but you do see the fluid fluid levels. And then you look histologically, right? And this almost looks like an ABC under low power. It almost looks benign. But when you focus in and you go to high power, you see these ugly cells here, right? These bizarre ugly cells. You see cells of different sizes and shape. Instantly, that should tell you that this is cancerous. So the most likely diagnosis is going to be a telangiectatic osteosarcoma, and you would look for the osteoid production through it. So probably over uh, here in this location, there might be some wispy osteoid production. How about this one? Again, testing your ability to recognize uh, matrix, visible matrix how it might differ from one of the other tumors that we looked at. Good, exactly. You should be able to narrow this down that this is matrix that's most consistent with a cartilage type tumor or a hyaline cartilage tumor 
with ring and or calcifications. And then you see that the bone is destroyed here and that there's a big soft tissue mass. Hyaline cartilage tumors in the long bones or even in the digits or the pelvis should never extend into the soft tissues if they're benign, right? If they extend into the soft tissues, they're automatically cancerous. When you come over here and you look at your histology of it, right, you see a lot of binucleated and trinucleated cells. Think of this compared to your enchondroma, right? It's much more hypercellular. The cells are crowded onto each other. There's multiple cells in uh, lacunae, et cetera. So you put that all together, and this is probably a grade two chondrosarcoma, right? And yes, you would treat it with surgical resection, a proximal humerus replacement, radical resection, and limb sparing surgery and a proximal humor replacement. When you answer for your OITE, never answer radiation or chemotherapy for a, um, for a chondrosarcoma. Okay, it's never been shown to uh, really be effective. So they'll never ask you that actually. What about this one? What's the differential here? about what occurs in your tibia in the metadiaphyseal area. So a couple things, tibia and metadiaphysis. It does, it looks like a shark bite. So your tibia is a common site for adamantinoma and osteofibrous dysplasia, but usually, usually it's more confined to the cortex than this is, right? Non-ossifying fibromas occur in the metadiaphysis of the tibia. Distal tibia and proximal tibia are the most common sites. What else is a common tumor that occurs in the tibia, right? A chondromyxofibroma can arise eccentrically in the tibia. How about an aneurysmal bone cyst, an ABC also, right? That would be my main differential. So when you look at the histology, do you see adamantinoma here? Not really. Do you see osteofibrous dysplasia? No. Do you see an aneurysmal bone cyst with large lakes filled with blood? No. Do you see fibrous type tissue? No, right? You see mixoid type tissue that looks almost chondroid in nature. And you see fibrous type tissue down here. So you put it all together and you have chondromyxofibroma. Very rare tumor, probably the, the most rare tumor. Did you get that right, Yingling? Again, every, I think everybody knows this because I said it 10 times during the lecture. NOF, right? And this is what it looks like histologically. Spin, cells uh, are spindled out, but they all look very uniform and bland. They don't look bizarre in nature, right? You don't see any huge nuclei and pink fibrous tissue in bundles scattered throughout and often a swirling type pattern to it. patient presents with a lesion in the metatarsal, second metatarsal. Painful in response to NSAIDs. That's an osteodosteoma. Good. And histologically, what does it look like? Osteodosteoma and osteoblastoma look very similar, 
right? They're bone producing tumors, but because they're benign, they want to try to recapitulate normal anatomy and make uh, trabeculae. So you see here osteoblasts that are lined up nice and orderly along the trabeculae of bone, and the, bone, the trabeculae are kind of interconnecting throughout this entire area. Right? So you're trying to form normal bone here, and you have fibrovascular type tissue in between. Osteoid osteomas and osteoblastoma are, are very heavily vascularized. So and this is what the nidus looks like, right? Different from your osteosarcoma where you have lace-like osteoid in between. Good. Aneurysmal bone cysts, right, let's just look at this again. You have a lesion that's starting centrally but expanding eccentrically. So you see here where the bone is being eroded and you have some expansion of the bone, and then you have multiple fluid fluid levels, and you have a sharp zone of transition, right? Tumor sh sharp cut off. And then histologically, you see these large lakes of blood, and you usually see a thickened wall. The wall is usually thicker than that of a UBC, and you can see scattered giant cells in the wall of an ABC. What's this? 20 year old with hip pain. The OITE does this to you all the time. They can put two of the same diagnoses on the, on the test to double test you, right? To make you think that you're crazy, that you can't possibly have two same diagnoses on the test. So again, this is an osteoid osteoma. You see the nidus here, benign periosteal reaction. Osteoid osteomas can really occur any place, on the surface of the bone, in the medullary canal. When they occur on the surface of the bone or in the cortex, you get um, you get an exuberant periosteal reaction around it. And again, just like I just showed you in the other example, you have the interconnecting trabeculae and of, of woven bone with the mature osteoblasts around the perimeter producing it. If you got a CAT scan of this, you could see the nidus more closely, usually a lucency within the sclerotic bone, and there may be some mineralization within the actual nidus. Here's another example for comparison of a cortically based lesion. Think about the differential again. The shape of the lesion, how it might differ from the osteoid osteoma. Again, pain, but the pain does not respond to an NSAID. one weighted image post contrast some enhancing areas here what's happening over here and under here then look at over here is the periosteum intact around this What's an OBJ? Oh, osteoblastoma. Odell Beckham. <laughs> right, so EG is always in your differential of almost anything, right? So I do like this for EG, um, but you can see like it, 
it's almost like something formed in the bone. You have this extensive enhancement in the medullary canal. It's almost like it formed in the bone. It may be creating this extensive edema or enhancement, and it's almost decompressed itself through a narrow channel as opposed to destroy the cortex. And it looks like it's spreading under the soft tissues into the skin. So when you have these narrow channels, it's usually like a sinus tract or an infection. So let's see. And if you look at the histology, right, this is what infection looks like. Right, you see small round blue cells in here, right? You could pick out probably some PMNs if you had a higher power. But what about this bone tells you that this is infection? There's, a, there's something about this bone that should lead you to believe that it's infection. Right, it's dead, right? What's it called, the involucrum, right? Is the involucrum the dead, the dead portion or is that the volucrum, involucrum, right? Uh, and there's no cells in it indicating that it's dead. When you get pus in the bone, it kills the bone and you get necrosis of the bone. So exactly, that's a, that's a Brody's abscess that's kind of decompressed itself with a lot of extensive edema within it. And you can see how the pus just permeates through the trabeculae. On an MRI, you usually have preservation of marrow fat when you have an infection because it doesn't necessarily get rid of all the fat in the marrow, whereas when you have a tumor in the marrow, it replaces the marrow or the, or the fat within the marrow. Let's do this one. Any ideas? What's the differential here? Anybody think this is an, uh, an osteochondroma? No rings and arcs. So this is what ossification looks right. It looks ivory-like and white. Right? What's going on here? Right, so you see almost this bland fibrous tissue making bone. Right? And there's no osteoblasts around the bone. The bone do have nuclei in it, so it's not dead bone, right? But there's no osteoblasts around it, so it's being made by the tumor, and it's fibrous in nature. So you put that all together, this is a paraosteal osteosarcoma, right? Paraosteals are treated with just surgery alone. They're low-grade in nature, and you treat it with a radical resection and a reconstruction, no chemotherapy, okay? Now, if these are left around for a long time, they can de-differentiate or components of it can become high grade and it could actually grow backwards into the medullary canal. Uh, and usually the ones that grow backward into the medullary canal are higher grade or grade two or grade three. Those are the ones that more often correlate with metastatic disease or cause mets later on. But a pure paraosteal osteosarcoma has a 90% cure rate with surgery alone, it's got less than a 10% metastatic rate. So low grade, meaning slow growing and unlikely to metastasize. One last one. Surface of the bone lesion. Think about your tumors that occur on the surface of the bone. Think about your types of mineralization. John York, you know, have any idea?
John, did you send a an image, Yingling? So if you narrowed this down to being cartilaginous, you are correct, right? Because you see ring and arcs here, right? Now, the question is, is if it was a periosteal chondroma or a periosteal chondrosarcoma? And I could tell you, radiographically, usually periosteal chondrosarcomas are greater than five centimeters, and chondromas are usually less than five centimeters. Usually, chondrosarcomas erode or saucerize the underlying cortex, and usually the chondromas sit on the surface of the bone and do not erode the underlying cortex. So this is actually a periosteal chondroma. And you can see that actually this is one of the exceptions. Periosteal chondromas can actually be much more cellular than a than an enchond or than an en typical enchondroma, and that's just you know that's just a given. It takes sometimes a very good pathologist to differentiate this from a malignancy, so they have to look at the radiographs and 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 correlate it. But uh, yeah, per that would be just surgical removal. Okay, so we could always do more another night, but I wanted to thank everybody for for doing this. This is this could be a series of webinars with us if we want to get mutually agreeable times where it's easy easier to do uh, teaching from remote locations. And also, we're going to start rolling this out with various attendings throughout the system to do lectures, and we will certainly. Um, you know, include the residents if you want to, if it's, res if it's, there may be resident specific lectures or there may be lectures that we give to, you know, primary care doctors or other orthopedic surgeons and we'll certainly include it, include you on it, but we're just trying to work the, the, uh, the, uh, what do you think of that, huh? <laughs> we'll certainly try to include you all on it, and you can join it whenever you like. But maybe we could do something official like this for the residencies, and maybe have uh, St. Joe's versus uh, Jersey City, and see see who gets the most questions right. Got to work on those emojis. Look at Jill's even got one. Jill, you're so tan in your emoji. Anybody have any questions? We can figure it out. We could get something going. Uh, we could plan out a, a, a schedule for this for the entire year, if you would all like, whatever you want to do. So yes, yeah, so sometimes giant cells, if they're if they're a type C, right? If the margin around it is a type one C, it could be could be difficult to tell on the X-ray as to whether or not it's permeative or it's um, or if it's geographic. So you have to put together some other clues if it's eccentric, and usually giant cells occur in the 20 to 40 age group. Right, so you have to put some things together, and then if you need to, you need to go get the, um, you know, the advanced imaging, either a CT or an MRI, and see if it's truly geographic. But again, you put together the radiology with the pathology. So for your for your tests and your boards, they they might give you a confusing X-ray like that, but they're probably going to give you a decent enough pathology sample where you should be able to narrow it down. And you know, the, the questions are always tricky. Usually you can narrow it down to two and then you have to pick the best one. So as we go on, we can learn, you know, we'll do more and more examples and, and ultimately questions and unknowns so that you get to figure out the tricks of the questions.
Okay, have a nice night, and let's figure it out for some more lectures.